Good morning. What a terrific and lively bunch we have on a rainy morning in New York City. I'm thrilled that you all made it to be here with us for this climate symposium. My name is Jennifer Bernstein, and I'm the uh, CEO and president here at the New York Botanical Garden. And it is such a pleasure to welcome you all here during Climate Week. Here at the garden, the study and conservation of plants has long been central to our mission. And we know well that the, the world cannot adequately grapple with the intersecting climate and biodiversity crises without a deep understanding of plants. So we're very interested in doing our part to contribute to crafting solutions that address these issues and to bringing forward uh, voices in this world to talk to our audiences about the solutions that are at hand for all of us to help advance. Climate change impacts all of us. We're seeing it every day in all kinds of ways. The devastating floods in Pakistan that have affected 33 million people. Amid this kind of loss and um, really scary things, you know, I, I think all of us have to ask, what can we do? And so that's part of what we're going to explore today. And our speakers are very well positioned to offer the kind of insight and hope that I know we all need. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is with us this evening. And we are so thrilled to have such an esteemed atmospheric scientist and preeminent climate change expert. And she'll be giving this morning's keynote address for the symposium. Dr. Hayhoe is the Paul Whitfield Horn Distinguished Professor and an endowed chair of, in public policy and public law at Texas Tech University in their Department of Political Science. And recently, in 2021, Dr. Heho joined the Nature Conservancy as chief scientist. She's a wonderful and important voice in the climate uh, discussion. And we're thrilled to have her here today to discuss the implications of and solutions to climate change and share what each of us can do to play a role in mitigating its effects. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Heho. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be with you here today on what was a rainy morning, but now the sun's starting to peek out. As you know, it is Climate Week in New York. And so this is part of a series of events going on all around the city, hosted by all different organizations, all focused on why climate change matters and what we can do about it. So I want this to be a conversation. And so I'm gonna do something unusual. I'm gonna ask you to actually go ahead and take out your phone. But you can turn the ringer off while you're doing so. And I want you to go ahead and go to pollev.com slash Catherine, or the easy way is you take a picture of this with your phone. It just sends you right to the right link. If you are going to type it in, though, it's pollev.com slash, and now here's the tricky part, K-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E. And when you go there, I'm going to ask you a question. I see a few phones still up, so I'll give you one more minute. I'm going to ask you a question, and this is a very important question to begin with. In the morning, what do you need the most? Oh, it looks like our, our coffee drinkers are really taking things away. <laughs> and I think you must have had your coffee because you're responding very quickly. <laughs> People who might not have had that already might still be lagging. All right. Oh, I was wondering if we're going to get a, I need nothing. One brave person needs nothing. <laughs> I included garden because we are at the botanical gardens. And you know, being out in the garden in the morning really is a wonderful way to start the day. But it looks like, it looks like the coffee is taking it. All right. Oh, tea is coming in a little bit. Just for the record, my answer is tea. I am a huge tea fan. I have an entire row of various types of black teas. Now, I'm going to ask you a slightly harder question. We were just getting warmed up here. Now I'm going to ask you a question that requires a word. Just one word, not two words, just one word. But you can pick the word. I want to know who you are. Give me a word that describes who you are, any word. And don't say human, because that's sort of obvious. I just want to know, what do you do? Who are you? What's important to you? 
Why are you here? Oh, I like that. Somebody said kind. That's a really good word. A lot of teachers, educators, students, gardeners, mothers, researchers, scientists, people who, mm, are you really a cat? <laughs> I'm going to call foul on that one. Because I have tried to get my cat to type, and he will not do it. Well, no, actually, he will, but it doesn't actually come out as C-A-T. It comes out as all the letters in the keyboard together. All right. So it looks like we have a strong contingent of gardeners here, as I suspected. But we also have a very strong contingent of teachers, students, educators, activists, parents, grandparents, children. Love to see Sailor there. I also sail and mobilizers, excellent. All right, now I'm gonna ask you a third question. And the third question is even more difficult, but now you have the hang of this. The third question you're gonna to have to answer again with one word, only one word, not two. And the third question is about climate change. When I say climate change, how do you feel? How do you feel when someone says climate change to you? That's a good word. Afraid, scared, frustrated, anxious, depressed, worried, concerned. I can tell you that I just started asking this question last year. And it's gotten to the point where I have asked now probably uh, almost two dozen different groups of people. I have asked architects. I've asked nuns. I've asked students, I've asked business people, I've asked educators and teachers, I've asked fellow scientists. I have asked people this question now over the last year about two dozen times, and if you took what you put right here and you didn't know who was saying it, you couldn't tell the difference because I am getting the same answer from everyone. Everyone I talk to is worried, scared, concerned, angry, anxious, overwhelmed, freaked out, disappointed. And when we look at the science, this is a perfectly reasonable and rational response. As far back as we can go in the history of the planet, we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. And what we know today is we know why it's happening. We know that since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we started digging up coal back then, and obviously oil and gas more today, and burning it, we started to produce all kinds of heat-trapping gases. And those heat-trapping gases have been building up in the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, where they are effectively wrapping a blanket around the planet, causing it to warm. That's climate change explained in two cartoons in 30 seconds. But this is not new science. We've known that our planet had a natural blanket that keeps us the perfect temperature for life since the work of Joseph Fourier in the 1820s. We have known that digging up and burning coal produces heat trapping gases and by those gases building up in the atmosphere, the planet is getting warmer since the work of John Tyndall, an Irish scientist in the 1850s, and Mrs. Eunice Foote, a scientist from upstate New York, in 1856. She literally wrote a paper that was presented to the American, uh, the, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a meeting I still attend today. And in that paper in 1856, Eunice Foote wrote that if CO2 were higher, the planet would be warmer. Then by the time we get to the 1890s, Svante Arrhenius, a Swedish chemist who won the Nobel Prize for his work in physical chemistry, on the weekends, he decided, because this is what scientists do for fun, he decided that using all of the physics and chemistry they knew in the 1890s, he was going to calculate how much warmer the world would get if we doubled or tripled levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. The calculations took him about two years by hand, and today, of course, we use the most powerful supercomputers in the world. But his answer was almost identical to what we get today. Interesting factoid, he was a distant cousin of Greta Thunberg's. 
And then by the 1930s, Guy Callender, a British engineer who, common theme here, in his spare time for fun, rode around and collected all of the temperature data around the world and analyzed it to show in the 1930s that the planet was already warming due to burning fossil fuels. This is not new science. So you might say, well, you know, what's new today then? What's new today, according to the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, is that the warming that we're seeing is unprecedented in our history. Is that not reason to be concerned? Is that not reason to be worried? It absolutely is. This is an entirely rational response to the impacts that we are seeing today. And how is it affecting us? The biggest way it's affecting us is by what I call loading the weather dice against us, taking our naturally occurring extreme weather events and making our droughts more intense, like the one that they had in Europe this summer or the drought that continues to engulf the Southwest US, making our heat waves more dangerous. You couldn't even keep track of how many heat waves we had this summer. Every week there was a new one in the news. Wildfires burning greater area. Most wildfires out west are the result of accidental human ignition. So where does climate change come in? Well, imagine dropping a match on a pile of green, wet wood. What happens? Not much. Then imagine dropping that match accidentally on a pile of bone-dry kindling. That's the difference between with or without climate change. And then let's talk about the rain and the floods. We know that warmer air holds more water vapor, and so when a storm comes along today, there's more water vapor for that storm to pick up and dump on us than there was 50 or 100 years ago. And then you bring hurricanes into the mix, they're fueled by warm ocean water. And over 90% of the heat being trapped by this extra blanket we're wrapping around the planet is going into the ocean where it is fueling stronger storms. When we look in the news, we see headline after headline. Almost a year ago, the floods in New York from Ida. A few weeks ago, the massive destruction of the floods in Pakistan. Wherever we live, we have a set of natural weather dice. And we always have a chance of rolling a double six, but as the planet warms decade by decade, it's taking one of those numbers and turning into another six, another, and then even some sevens. And we start to say, how could the US have three actually, excuse me, five, five 1,000 year floods in five weeks. That's not a 1,000 year flood anymore when you have one a week. When we look across the whole United States, back in the 1980s, we would have on average one weather and climate disaster that caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage every four months. Back in the 1980s, by the 2010s, we had at least $1 billion weather and climate disaster every three weeks, four months to three weeks. And this year, feels like it's every week. Not only that, but we scientists can put numbers on just how much worse climate change made things. The devastating heat wave and wildfires last summer, not this past summer, but the one before in June, 150 times more likely. Deadly floods in Germany, seven times more likely. Economic damages of Hurricane Harvey, four times greater than they would have been without the impacts of a changing climate. And why do we care about these impacts? Because it's not about saving the planet versus saving people. It's about us. We can't survive without the food that we grow on this planet. We can't survive without water. We can't survive without the amazing nature that surrounds us, even right here in the urban forests in New York City. We can't survive without the air that we breathe, yet all of these things are being affected by the impacts of burning fossil fuels in the changing climate. Did you know that burning fossil fuels alone is responsible for over 10 million premature deaths a year from the air pollution? Just the air pollution, not even talking about climate change. That's double the number of COVID deaths every year from breathing in the pollution from burning fossil fuels. And when we look at our infrastructure, our buildings, our roads, our water systems, our electricity systems, our supply chains, they were all built for a planet that no longer exists. 
We are conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home we have, and that is why it is not about saving the planet. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we are gone. It is quite literally about saving us. And by us, I mean, to be very clear, us humans and many of the other living things that share this planet with us. That is what this is about. So we absolutely have every reason in the world to be worried because we know that it's affecting every aspect of our lives. It's affecting our infrastructure, our economy, our energy, our water, our natural resources, our health. Climate change is affecting our food, our biodiversity, our conservation, all of the work that we're doing to try to restore this planet that we live on. Climate change is a threat multiplier making our efforts harder and harder. And most of all, climate change is an issue of justice and equity because it affects us all, but it doesn't affect us all equally. When we look at who is producing these heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, according to Oxfam, the 50% poorest people in the world, half of the people on the planet, the poorest half, are responsible for 7% of emissions. But when we look at the impacts, who is most affected? Women and children, especially in low-income countries. There's countries where they've outlawed child marriage and numbers were going down and then they started to go back up again, why? When there's no way to feed your family due to record-breaking drought, Sometimes the only choice you have is to sell your daughters. Indigenous peoples who have already lost so much of the tenure and their land rights, they can serve over 80% of the world's biodiversity on lands managed by indigenous peoples, yet they are disproportionately affected by climate change. And then right here, right here where we live, and where I live myself in Texas, it's the lower income neighborhoods, which are often black and brown neighborhoods that are disproportionately affected not only by pollution, but also by flooding, by extreme heat. They're the last to get the lights back on when disaster hits and the power goes down. Climate change affects all of us, but it doesn't affect us all equally. Globally, we already see that climate change has increased the economic gap between the world's richest and poorest countries by 25%. That has already happened. Think about the United Nations General Assembly in town this week. Think about all the countries represented. Think about the fact that there is a 25% bigger gap between those countries today than there was 50 years ago already, thanks to climate change. And then just before COVID, the United Nations was sharing how climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of development, global health and poverty reduction. And then COVID hit. What do you think happened? The two crises interacted and exacerbated each other, pushing even more people into poverty. So we have every reason to be worried, every reason. That is a rational, reason, rational reasonable response to the facts. But when we look around, this is the way we often see the world. We think, I'm worried, and clearly everybody we know here is worried, but there's all these people who never want to talk about it, and they're not worried. So what do we have to do? We think if they just knew how bad it was, that would get them on board. So we load up our wheelbarrow, or sometimes even our dump truck, full of scary facts, 100% true scary facts about the polar bears and Antarctica and the ice sheets and the tipping points. All of the headlines that we see about how it's really bad and it's getting worse and we may be doomed. And we dump them on people. So climate changes and we get worried, we load up with all of our scary data. But if you've ever done this, you might have been puzzled by the response you got. Because most of the time, the response that you get is not, oh my goodness, I need to get busy. But it's more often people just pulling the covers back up over their heads, so to speak, metaphorically. And we think, well, 
What's it going to take? And then we double down. What we're leaving out of the equation is two important things. How our brains are wired and what people actually think. We assume we know how people's brains are wired. We think everybody's brains are wired exactly the same as ours. And we also assume that, that, that what they're thinking is what we think they're thinking. So I'm a physical scientist, but my biggest learning curve the last few years has been in the social sciences. And what the social sciences tell us, and Tali Sherrod is actually a neuroscientist who wrote a really good book called The Influential Mind, which is not about climate change, but it's actually all about climate change. She says, just talking about the way the human brain works, that's all, just the human brain, not climate, just how our brain is wired. Fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. So we're stuck in this loop of here's more scary information, here's more headlines that are full of fear, people just push it off more. But there's more to it than that. This is how we think people are. Small group of us worried, me and everybody I know, and then everybody else who doesn't want to talk about it. But when we look at polling data, it turns out the picture's very different. When we look at polling data, oops, there we go. This is the way we look. It turns out that the vast majority of people are worried. And you might say, oh, well, you're talking about global. You're not talking about the US. No. I'm talking about the US. Now, global numbers are higher, but in the US, the majority of people are worried. A very small group is not worried, but based on the thousands of conversations I've had, I would put money on them actually being worried deep down, but being really good at keeping the lid on. It's a defense mechanism. But here's the interesting thing. Only a small group is activated. In fact, the gap between people who are or aren't worried is less than half of the size between the gap of, of the people who are worried and the people who are activated. So what's the biggest gap we need to bridge? If everybody who were worried were activated, that would pretty much be what we needed. And that gap is twice as big. In fact, the specific numbers are, as of last year, and I again would put money on it being higher this year, thanks to the summer we just had. But as of last year, 70% of Americans are worried. 83% of mothers are worried. 86% of young people are worried. But 50% of people feel hopeless, helpless, and don't know where to start. 50%. And so when we load more fear-based facts on people who feel helpless and hopeless and don't know where to start, what's the natural response? If I don't know what to do, I don't want to hear more doom because I don't know what to do. And that's why only 8% of us are activated. So what do we have to do? We have to address the real problems. The real problems are not lack of access to what's happening, information on what's happening to the polar bears and the ice sheets and sea level rise. The real problems are we have to connect our head, which is already full of a lot of information, to our heart. Why does it matter to me personally? And then we have to connect our heart to our hands. What are we going to do about it? So I want to talk about the head-to-heart connection, and then I want to talk about the heart-to-hands connection. Why does it matter to me, and what can we do to fix it? So why do we have this head-to-heart gap? This gap is called psychological distance, and it's something that we're all really good at. We are all really good at saying, oh, well, you know, I'll just eat that now. It doesn't really matter. Or I don't really have to stand up and walk around and exercise as much as they say. I'll do that later. We're all really good at putting off risks to the future or saying, oh, that's those people over there, not me, or that's those people who care about that, but not me. Well, it turns out that we see this in climate change. If you ask people, is global warming happening? And I've pulled out Bronx County right here, so you can see. Bronx County is a bit higher than the average, but most people across the United States, according to the Yale Program on Climate Communications surveys, most people would say, yes, it's happening. Each little square here is a county, 
And any way that's orange means more than 50% of people, and the darker orange it is, the more people say yes. So will it harm plants and animals? Where's the psychological distance here? Non-human species. Yeah. Will it harm future generations? Where's the psychological distance here? Future, not now. Will it harm people in developing countries? Where's the distance? Over there, not here. And then they ask this question. Will it harm you? This is the head to the heart gap. But there's one map that's even darker blue. And it starts to show us what we need to do about this. They then ask people, do you ever talk about it? Even once in a while. And look at that. Even here is only 41%. What's the connection? The connection is this. If we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever do anything about it? Is talking sufficient? Of course not. But is talking essential? 100%. How do humans ever do anything working together without communicating about it? Now, it might be in writing, it might be verbally, it might be posting something. We can communicate through art. We can even communicate through other people seeing us do things. But how do humans ever accomplish something without some form of communication? And we're not doing it. So why are we stuck? We don't know what to do. In fact, I was talking to Tony Lizerowitz from Yale, who did, did these surveys last night. And he said, we asked all the people who were worried about climate change, would you be willing to engage with your elected officials, with your elected leaders? Would you be willing to use your voice to call for change? And the vast majority of people who were worried said yes. And then he asked, are you doing it? And the vast majority said no. And then he said, why not? And the number one answer they got was, because no one asked me to. How do we ask people to do things? By using our voice to say, hey, I did this. You want to do this with me? Or I haven't done this yet, but I'm thinking about it. You want to come. You want to do it. You want to write this with me? You want to say this? You want to have a conversation with the place we work? You want to have a conversation with our neighborhood? You want to have a conversation with our elected officials? A conversation with our school or our university? A conversation with our church? A conversation with our Rotary Club? A conversation with the folks that we walk our dogs with? Having that conversation is critical to catalyze action. And you know what? Every single one of us has a voice we can use. I have seen eight-year-olds have very effective conversations to catalyze action. I have seen 95-year-olds have incredibly effective conversations to catalyze action. We all, whoever we are, have a voice. We might not have the platform of a giant influencer on social media. I'm one of the most followed climate scientists in the world, and my social media platform is significantly less than a second-rate cat on TikTok. <laughs> so believe me, we none of us here have really big platforms, unless there's somebody here I don't know about. But we all know people. We all know people, and we are all part of organizations and groups of people where we can use our voices to catalyze change. Now, you might say, OK, well, what am I supposed to talk about? You told me it's not about the polar bears. What am I supposed to talk about? Two things, how climate change affects us and what we can do to fix it. So I was literally asked the other day, how do you talk about the polar bears where I live? And the person asking the question didn't live in Greenland. They didn't live in Churchill. They didn't live in Svalbard. They lived in Iowa. So I said, you don't. I live in Texas, where I often talk about cotton to farmers like Jack, who haven't had a decent crop since 2005. My colleague, Joellen Russell, lives in Arizona, where she has to wake her kids up before dawn in the summer, because that's the only time when it's cool enough for them to go outside and play. 
We can talk about the safety of our homes and ourselves and our families when it floods like it does here in New York, increasingly due to climate change. We can talk about our amazing forests, our urban forests, the forests that surround us. We can talk about snow. We can talk about whatever it is that's near and dear to our hearts. So in my book, Saving Us, I actually talk about how it's good to do an inventory of yourself. Who are you? What do you love? So I can definitely talk about science to people who love science. I'm a Canadian, so I talk about what's happening in Canada, but I live in Texas, so I definitely talk about the crazy floods we just had in Dallas a few weeks ago. I'm a mother, so I help to co-create an organization called Science Moms that's all about empowering mothers to use their voice to advocate for their kids. Don't worry, there's a lot of dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles who've also joined Science Moms too. I'm a Christian, so I often talk with fellow Christians, people who share my faith, about how I am motivated by my faith to care about this issue. I like a beach vacation. I love good wine. I knit. I have started conversations with every single one of those things because they're near and dear to my heart and then connected the dots to a changing climate. So I just want to check in with you to make sure you're all tracking and paying attention. Question for you here. Who are you and why do you care about climate change? I want a bunch of different words here again. I care about climate change because I am a what? You might care because you're a scientist like me. You might care because you're a parent or a grandparent and you want the best possible future for your child. You might care because you love forests or you love birds or you love kayaking or skiing. You might care because you're a concerned citizen. You might care, oh, I love that, because you're a scuba diver. I have a story in my book about how a scientist came up to me one time and he said, I've been trying to work with churches and I just can't get my foot in the door. What's the secret? So I said to him, well, you know, what's your own faith background? And he said, none, I'm an atheist. So I said, stop. That's not the place for you to have the conversation. I said, what do you love? And he said, science. I said, of course, you're a scientist. What else? So I said, you know, are you a Rotary Club member? Do you do this? Do you do that? You know, no, no, no. And then finally he said, well, I am a scuba diver. And I said, well, there you go. I said, don't you think divers need to know about climate change? And you're the perfect person to tell them what's happening in the ocean and how they could even possibly be part of a citizen science program to track what's happening. I love the diversity here. We've got people who are mothers, fathers, grandparents, sisters, siblings, and children. We've got people who are photographers and artists. We've got people who work with landscape and with nature, but we've got people who manage other people. Whoever we are is the perfect person to care. And whoever somebody else is is the perfect person to care. And we don't have to make them care for the same reason we do. We have to help them figure out what reason they have. Connect the dots from the head to the heart. But then we also have to connect the dots to the hands. Now, at the end here, I'm going to answer just a couple of your questions. We're not at the end yet. We're still about five minutes away from the end. But I'm going to answer a few of your questions, so I'm going to give you a chance now. From now on, you can put your questions up here, and the fun part is you can upvote the questions you most want me to answer. Because we have a wonderful panel coming up after this. We're going to have a short break and then a panel. But I'm going to just take just a few questions, the ones that are most upvoted at the end. But we still have a bit more to go because I've only talked about the first half here. Let's get to the second half, and then we'll do a couple of questions. We have to talk about the head to the heart, but then we have to talk about the heart to the hands, what can we do to fix it? And so I love the fact that many of my fellow scientists are stepping up talking about what they're doing. Gaurab is a health scientist who studies the impact of climate change on health. And I love this tweet he put on Twitter the other day. Booyah, our house is all electric. Why? Because it is more healthy that way. Gas stoves are actually a huge source of inside indoor pollution. My colleague Kim Cobb always posts about how she bikes to work. She bikes with her kids. I posted about our solar panels that I love because not only do they give us electricity, they charge my car too. My colleague Henry Drake games and while he's playing Fortnite, he literally talks about climate change. I have a newsletter every week that has one piece of good news, one piece of not so good news, 
and one thing you can do. And there I share information, like did you know that the majority of energy workers around the world are clean energy workers now? 56% are clean energy workers. Or did you know that putting carbon labels on menus makes people choose different food? Or that roundabouts save lives and save carbon? When we have conversations, we humans are very curious, and starting a conversation with a piece of good news and a did you know is a great way to start a conversation with somebody who's already worried but doesn't know what to do. I love going to Project Drawdown. If you're not familiar with Project Drawdown, they are a great resource of phenomenal climate solutions. You can just go down that list and you will have 100 conversation topics at your fingertips. I love little factoids like, did you know we waste over 67% of our energy and 40% of our food? So reducing food waste is a huge way that we all can help. And through energy efficiency alone, the US could cut carbon emissions in half and save money. That's a great piece of did you know to start a conversation with. I love talking about climate solutions that take carbon out of the atmosphere where we have too much of it and put it back in the ground and the soil and the ecosystems where we need it. It's not only about planting trees, it's about restoring forests and grasslands and peatlands and coastal wetlands. It's about smart agriculture and cover crops and no-till that puts carbon back in the soil. It's not just about what's over there, it's about what's right here, working with cities around the world. Cities for Forests is a really cool program that partners with many cities, including New York City, to connect cities directly to urban forests, to forests nearby, and to forests abroad. I love talking about projects like the Nature Conservancy's Green Heart Project in Louisville, Kentucky. Urban neighborhoods are very prone to flood and extreme heat. And during a heat wave across the US, in big cities from Minneapolis to Miami, Low-income neighborhoods lacking tree canopy and green spaces can be up to 15 degrees Fahrenheit hotter during the same heat wave than a better off neighborhood. 15 degrees hotter. The impact on people's health, on their power bills, is shocking. But then, what else do green spaces do? They absorb water. And a lot of those neighborhoods are often located in flood zones because that was the cheaper land to build on. What else do trees do? They filter our air, and a lot of those neighborhoods have much higher air pollution because they have factories there or they're located beside freeways. And green spaces provide a place for us to go to take our kids. They improve our mental health, our physical health. I love talking about those types of win-win-win solutions where we've got cleaning up the air, providing a place for water to go, cooling down during heat waves, and improving our health. Oh, and as they grow, they take up carbon too, right? I love talking about these win-win-win solutions, and there's so many of those that give us cleaner air and water, protect us from disasters, improve our physical and mental health, provide more affordable energy. Solar energy is the cheapest form of electricity around the world. Reduce our inequalities, which climate change is increasing. Create healthy ecosystems and foodscapes because we have to grow food for our 8 billion people. And they give us a more stable world. I love talking about what's actually happening, who, what people are doing, what countries are doing, what mothers are doing in India, what young evangelicals are doing in the United States, what churches are doing all around the world, and faith-based organizations of all kinds. I love talking about what universities and colleges are doing. I love talking actually about what companies are doing. That often surprises people. Now, obviously, there's a lot more for companies to do. But let's talk about what people are doing, not just what they aren't doing. I love talking about what cities are doing. Did you know the city of Houston has a climate action plan to do its part to meet the Paris target? It's the home of the oil and gas industry in the United States. Of course, New York City also has one too, as does Washington DC and Chicago and many other cities around the US and around the world. The bottom line is people are willing to change if they feel efficacy, 
if we feel like what we do can make a difference. And currently, we have a stunning lack of efficacy. We feel like nothing we can do can make a difference. We feel, in fact, like the giant boulder of climate action is sitting at the bottom of an incredibly steep hill with only a few hands on it. Sir David Attenborough, Greta Thunberg, Al Gore, they've all got their shoulders to that boulder trying to push it up and it isn't budging an inch, we feel. And if I add my hand, it's not gonna make a difference, we think. But when we start looking around at all of the people, all of the organizations, all of the cities, states, countries, companies, churches, colleges, universities, tribal nations, when we start looking around at all of the action that is happening, we realize that giant boulder is already at the top of the hill. It is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It already has millions of hands on it. And if I add mine, and if you add yours, it will go faster. And how do we start doing that? We start doing it by knocking over the first domino. What is the first domino? The first domino is having that conversation about what? about why it matters, and about what we can do to fix it. As George Marshall says, he wrote a great book called Don't Even Think About It, How Your Brain is Wired to Ignore Climate Change. He said, talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. In its absence, it's impossible for a group of people to solve a problem. But the goal of the conversation is not to tell people about it, the head, it's to connect to the heart and then the hands, expand the number of people in the conversation. So remember, I started with this, climate changes and we get worried. We should be worried, but what do we do? Now you know, right? We talk about why it matters to us and what positive constructive solutions do are, look like. What is the New York Botanical Gardens doing? What is the city of New York doing? What is the state of New York doing? There's a ballot initiative coming up that you can vote on, by the way, in New York. You gotta flip the ballot over and then check yes. What are companies doing? What are organizations you're part of doing? And then what happens? Something amazing happens, people feel empowered. And that's when action results, because you know what? Let's go right back to that neuroscience. According to the way our brains are wired, our brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not with avoiding harm. So reframe your message. And again, this book is not about climate change, but again, it's all about climate change. Reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not dread. And how do we keep that hope alive? We keep it down, we keep it alive, through having that conversation. And you might say, your last ditch attempt to get out of this, well, I'm not a scientist. Guess what, according to the scientist, or science I should say, the second best messengers are scientists, the best messenger is you. People we know are the best messenger. So I wanna ask you now, one last question. How do you feel about climate change now? How do you feel about climate change now? You might have to think about it a little bit. Oh, that's a great first word. Determined. Absolutely, because you know what? We're worried, but we're not activated. But now we know what we can do. Do something, anything, and talk about what you did yourself. Find out what somebody else is doing and talk about that. Ask, hey, they're doing it. Why aren't we doing it? or we're already doing this, great job, let's do more. Every single piece of major societal change in this world has begun by people talking about it. And I love this. Motivated, determined, empowered, <laughs> still scared and that's okay. Still depressed, absolutely. But we know in the words of Joan Baez, that the antidote to anxiety and despair is action. So act first, it's pretty crazy. Engage the hands first, and the hands go back to the head, heart, which go back to the head, and that is how we move forward.
by putting our hands on that boulder, by having that conversation, even if we're nervous or we're scared or we don't feel like it, and by looking around and seeing everything that's happening and realizing that we truly can make a difference. So I'm going to end with these words. The one thing we need more than hope is what? Action. Because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. Thank you. Now, after this, we're going to take a short break. And we have copies of my book and many other excellent books, including All We Can Save, which I contributed to out in the lobby. But you have been really phenomenal at helping me identify a couple of questions. So I'm going to run through these a couple of questions really quickly, and then we're going to take our break. And then there's an amazing panel coming up after this. You do not want to miss that panel. Oh, I love the first question. This is a great one. People often say, well, do we need individual action or system systemic change? And my answer is, Yes, because how does a system change unless people catalyze that change? Look at the civil rights movement. Look at women getting the vote. Looking at gay marriage. Look at all of the major societal changes that have happened in the last 100, 200, 300 years. Every single one of them began with what? With people using their voice to say we need change. What are corporations made up of? Corporations are made up of people, employees. They're made up of leaders. They're made up of shareholders. And they're made up of customers. What are all those four things? What do they have in common? They're all types of people. So what can we do? We can talk about what we can do more and better where each of us works. We can look at where our money is invested and make sure it is invested with companies who are making a difference. I was at a spoken word performance yesterday where he said something really phenomenal. He said, we can't afford any longer to make a dollar that doesn't make change. It's good, eh? He could have given this whole presentation in two minutes. <laughs> there are people who petition, people who protest, people who buy shares in a company specifically to show up at the meetings, like engine number one showing up at the Exxon meetings, to force the company to have a climate action plan. There are all kinds of ways that we can use our voices within and without all of the systems and organizations in this world. And that is how we as an individual make a difference. I love the fact that all the top questions were about this. And I recognize that that's a lot of what makes us feel hopeless. But when we realize that every piece of change in this world has happened because someone opened their mouth and said, there's a better future, but we're not going to get there if we don't change what we're doing, that is when change happens. So as you go forward, have that conversation. And if you're interested, tell me how it went. Thank you. <laughs>